Nation, Dave Thomas, the radio voice for JMU football and men's basketball, back spending some time with a former Duke who's earned and achieved status at the NFL level. And today we're talking to a member of the coaching staff of the Chicago Bears, former quarterback for the JMU Dukes, John DiFilippo. Coach, how you doing? Hey, Dave. Doing great. How you guys doing? I hope, I hope do- you're doing well down there. Doing great. First of all, as we always do, want to know you and your wife and your family. Hopefully everyone is doing well. It's been a different year for us, to say the least. Yes, it has. Uh, it's it's been a, a change in a lot of ways from what everyone's used to, and um, you know, family's doing good, and I hope yours, everyone out there is as well. And uh, but yeah, it's been different for sure. Well, we always like to try to get a little background, and, and I like to start from the bottom if we can, and just work our way up. And most folks know, and if they don't know, they're about to find out. Your dad was a coach and a college administrator. Is it safe to say he's the influence who first put a football in your hands? Um, you know, it's, I think it was more of the situations I was in, uh, than my dad, my, my parents have always been kind of find your own way and, and do what you kind of what you want to do. And I think it's the situations you're put in and, um, you know, fo- football for me is, is kind of, you know, shaped kind of my beliefs, my core beliefs and te- in terms of, you know, relationships with people, uh, you know, in terms of teamwork, putting, you know, team before self, uh, you know, all those things that I think are important life lessons that, football teaches a young man. And very fortunately, I've been able to be a part of it here now for going on a, a long time. So it's been a good ride. Were you always around teams? And, and, and did that create the interest for you as a young boy to want to be a member of those teams as you got older? 100%. And I, you know, I, was, I was very fortunate, you know, my dad being in it. Um, you know, he wasn't always around a lot, but he always included me. Like I never got, you know, probably as much one-on-one time with my dad as other, as other kids did. But I was always around to practice. I was always around, you know, we, we Christmas morning in Kentucky, we'd go watch the basketball team practice. And so it was a different, unique experience in terms of spending time. So the b- best thing my dad always did for me was always made me feel included in uh, no matter whether we were going to a basketball game, you know, football game, football practice, whatever. I was always felt like I was included and, and wanted to be there. How did you make your way to JMU? Because I don't know that your dad really ever crossed paths coaching in Virginia or even in the CAA per se. Sure. Um, good, yeah. Um, I saw JMU play for the first time um, my sophomore year in high school. Uh, my dad had just taken the athletic director's job at Villanova and uh, James Madison came up to, it may have been my junior year, but it was even my sophomore or junior year. And obviously, you know, Villanova and JMU play every year. So I remember watching the game. I, I still remember standing on the Villanova sideline like it was yesterday. I had my high school Letterman's jacket on, and you know we had played the night before. I was there watching the Villanova game, and there was this Mike Colley was quarterback in, at James Madison at the time, and he, well, he was a heck of a player. And they, you know, they had Macy Brooks and Jay Jones and Ed Perry, and you know all those guys ended up being my teammates. You know, and I just saw those guys just you know balling out that day, and it was a really good game. Uh, I wish I could, I think JMU won. Uh, I think they did win. I just remember being seeing Coach Wood, you know, in that offense he was running. He was running a lot of the one by three stuff that they had run at Miami, which is, you know, tied in on one side, three receivers on the other side, is what I mean by one by three. And I just was like, man, I want to be a part of this. And so, obviously, did a little more research um, with the school, and then uh, the they started recruiting me pretty much after that. And uh, Rip Shear had started recruiting me, and then um, Alex Wood continued to recruit me. And then I went down there for a camp the summer before my uh, senior year. And I remember stepping on campus for the first time and calling home and telling my parents, if I don't care about any of these other schools that recruit me, if, if, if this, if James Madison offers me, I'm coming. And my parents were, you know, at the time I'd never, my dad had been to campus before, um, but my mom hadn't. And they're like, are you sure? Well, what about this school? I was like, I just know it's a fit for me personally. And uh, just what we all know at the JMU campus is it's a special place. It's a happy place. Uh, whenever I describe to people, they're, they're like, what's JMU like? I'm like, it, it's a happy place. And that's that's the best way to describe it. So was Villanova in the mix recruiting you? And, and what was that like telling your dad, who's the AD at Nova? Sure. Yeah, I'm going to go to one of your conference football counterparts. Yeah. Um, yeah, they offered me coming out of high school. Uh, I'd known those coaches forever. They've been awesome to me. You know, Coach Talley, Dave Clawson, who's one mm-hmm. of my main mentors, is now the head coach at Wake Forest, was the offensive coordinator. Um, ended up giving me my first job right out of college. And so he's one of my main mentors. And so it was really difficult telling those guys no, for sure. Uh, but it was time for me to to branch off and, and kind of be my own man and, and you know, form my own relationships around campus and not be the 80s kid. 
So you talked about the bonds that football created for you and, and, and helped create who you are now. When you think about your time at JMU, what are the first things that come to mind for you about your time as a student athlete? Sure. Um, I think it's just my teammates, you know, is my teammates and coaches. And um, they're guys I still keep in touch with. Um, those are the guys that you, you get up in the morning and work out at 5 a.m. You, you go through hard times together. You go through great times together. You, end, you live together, you know, on campus. Um, you're on a unique schedule that, you know, the, you know, a lot of student athletes are in where you're li- you don't have a lot of, a lot of downtime. So obviously people of like my, like-minded people usually have a ten- tendency to flock together. And mm-hmm. uh, you know, I was very fortunate to have great teammates. You won a, a conference championship during that yeah. time. Those are special teams that that win those remember those. That's a that's a, it's almost like a an even different kind of bond that you have moving forward that you're always going to have. You're going to talk about. So, what was that conference championship like for you and being a part of a championship team like that? Well, unfortunately for me, I was in the hospital when it happened. Uh, I had broken three ribs and or four ribs in the game and you know, partially collapsed my lung um, against the University of Richmond. So. Uh, for me, it was a little more painful than most, but, uh, <laughs> but, but, you know, the pain subsided really quickly when uh, I'll never forget uh, coach Matthews and Mrs. Matthews walking in the hospital to check on me. And um, you know, the first question I asked was coach, do we win? You know, this is the day this is before. I know some, a lot of your listeners will think that this is uh, you know, how, how did life ever happen without cell phones and, and <laughs> you know, being able to follow the game cast on your, on your ESPN.com app. But trust me, it, it, there was life before ESPN.com apps. And uh, so I couldn't follow the game, obviously. I didn't have a cell phone. Uh, so uh, Coach Matthews came in and said, yeah, we won. And, and obviously, a lot of the pains have started then. Makes it a little bit easier, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is there a game that stands out, though, from your career that when you think back to college or you're talking with folks about your, your time at college, is there a game that comes to mind first and foremost for you? Yeah, I think it's always your first college pass I, as a quarterback. I, that's to me, when you go back and, and talk to, you know, quarterbacks, even at this level, you know, what are your most, Hey, I remember when I got thrown into this game, or I remember my, you know, being my throwing a deep for the first time or whatever. And I was not supposed to play my freshman year. Uh, I was planning on red shirting. And, and unfortunately we go on the road to Boston university that had football at the time. And Willie Gonzalez was our starting quarterback at the time. And it was our second game. And, uh, his his hand came down on somebody's helmet and he shat, literally shattered his hand. Mm. And uh, so that was the second game of the season. I was third string. I was just, you know, I was the emergency guy, you know, red shirt and but traveling and doing all that. And so all of a sudden, you know, I'm one hit away and, and you know, your eyes perk up a little bit, you know, and you're <laughs> like, man, I was playing uh, Lower Marion High School last year and I'm getting ready to play some of these folks. And um, so I got thrown in. Uh, Greg Maddox was then became the starter. He was the number two at the time, and he got banged around a little bit against the University of Maine. So I got I had to come in, and I was fortunate enough to Macy Brooks did a great job of getting open. I threw him a deep ball in my first college pass in, on homecoming. So we ended up in. Most importantly, we won that game. So that was uh, by far probably the most memorable. At Lower Marion High School, the, the the high school for Kobe Bryant as well. Yeah, that was our arch rival. So in high school, yeah, yeah, we are our two high schools been playing for. Shoot, it was a 99th meeting my senior year. So do the math. I graduated high school in 96. <laughs> now you, you, talked about, you talked about earlier that you're, you're telling people about JMU. And, and, yeah. and I know that I've heard stories from players who've come through the league that, that you, you know, you'll stop them and ask them about JMU. And we were in Philadelphia when you were in Philly. We were covering a basketball game. And uh, there was a little buzz going on behind mm-hmm. us. And, and you were there. You and your wife were there. JMU won the game. And you come over yeah. and you spoke to us. Uh, just, just to share the JMU, the JMU pride. That's something you take with you, isn't? Absolutely. I mean, you're always a Duke, forever, and uh, it's just a really neat place. I mean, and they've done such a great job. I mean, you know, from you know the, the from president's office on down to Jeff Bourne and his and his staff. I mean, you go back, and it's been a few years since I've been back. It's been since I was in Philly in '16. I drove my wife down because she'd never been. And you drive around campus and it just gives you a huge sense of pride uh, because of the way, you know, from an athletic standpoint, obviously the academics are fantastic, but you know, obviously we're on a sports show here, so it's okay to just talk athletics. Uh, from the 
sports, you know, from everyone has their own facility to the, the type of facility it is to, you know, the way the grounds are kept up, you know, I mean, there's no more beautiful place in America than, Har than James Madison and Harrisonburg in the springtime when the flowers are coming out and just little things like that, that just really, I don't want to say you take, you, you take it for granted when you're there because you do realize how nice it is, but it's a fun, it's a very good memory to have as an alum when I to think back and really, wow, I wish I would have appreciated that a little bit more, you know, those, those days, those nice spring days in, in, in Virginia in, in May and June. And, but it, it's an awesome place. I've had the pleasure to talk to a number of former players that have gone on and played. And I like to ask them when you come back to campus and you look at what's there now versus what was there when you played, how much jealousy and envy do you have for the current players? I wouldn't say it's jealousy. Uh, I would say it's 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 you're happy to be a, you know, a piece of hopefully a small. I was a I consider myself a very 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 small piece of the foundation that hopefully it was laid, to uh, to or have the program that it is now. Obviously, we are all very very proud of the program uh, and, and what you know it st stood the test of time of coaching changes, uh, of different players, different quarterbacks, different schemes, different everything and. You know, just the one consistent thing is it's the pride in the program. And I think that's that comes from the guys that are obviously playing now to the guys that came before them. When your career at JVU came to an end, did you know coaching was the next natural step for you or, or were you sort of undecided what you wanted to do? No, I, I, that's what I've always wanted. I, I, I knew that even before I showed up at James Madison that I knew I wanted to coach football for a living. Um, you know, my dad was a coach when I was younger and then took the path into athletic administration. Uh, you know, he and I are very much alike, but different at the same time in terms of personality. And he probably has a little more of that personality. And I'm not saying I don't, but I'm just saying he wanted to be more of the college administrator. And I knew I wanted to coach. And uh, so it's just, it's, it's a path that I've always wanted to be on. And I'm very fortunate to be in. How did you make the step into the NFL? Because that's not, that's not an easy step to get into. No, it's not. Um, you know, I was at the right place at the right time. Uh, I was the quarterback coach at, at Columbia University, and they had uh, an opening for what is called a quality control position. All right, a quality control position, uh, for your listeners that don't kind of know what that means, is, you know, you have graduate assistant coaches in college at the college level. It's basically what it, what it is. That's what it is at the pro level. You're basically a graduate assistant coach at the pro level. You're breaking down the tape. You're helping the, assist, the position coaches. You're the right hand guy for the, to the coordinator, um, and in that case, I was also the right you know the right hand guy to do a lot of the tasks for Coach Coughlin, Tom Coughlin at the Giants when I got hired there. So they had somebody turn the job down. Um, I'm not going to name names, but he's a he's a prominent college coach right now. Wow! And uh, he had turned the job down, and so uh, I was kind of across the river right there. I was right there in New York City, coaching at Columbia in the Ivy League, and. Uh, you know, a guy I knew on staff called me up and says, hey, if you come over and interview for this job, if he offers it to you, you have to take it because he's getting mad at me, the guy that was running the search, because I've already had one guy turn, turn him down. So I got over there and uh, Coach Coughlin fortunately offered me the job the following morning and I took it and I've uh, been very fortunate now to be in the NFL for a while. Making that step from college coaching to pro coaching, even in quality control, just being around it. Yep. What were those first couple of days like and how wide were your eyes to the difference of the speed of the game or terminology or just the fact that it's a business and you're no longer dealing with student athletes? Yeah, that's it's a huge change the way you, you deal with the players. And I think some some guys are, you know, can make that transition and some guys struggle, you know, and, and I was fortunate enough to you know, be young enough when I got in the NFL to where I was still kind of, you're still learning every day, but really still trying to find your way and in, in, in how you do things and, and that. And I had great mentors when Coach Coughlin, uh, that, you know, would correct me when I was wrong. You know, was one of those coaches that wanted to develop his coaches and you, know, you call that coaching your coaches. And uh, he coached me hard and uh, I'm still, you know, very, very lucky that to this day. And but, you know, the biggest thing for me was not so much the football part of it was just like, holy cow, I'm walking in a giant stadium every morning. Like, it was pretty cool, you know, like and then uh, it, it, once you realize you're, you're, you're there for one purpose, it, it, you realize you're there for to, to do the job. So obviously, you know, when, when you're coaching at the college level, you know, you got to work around classes and those kind of things. Yeah. 
it's going to be different for it's a lot different for you now so if you will walk us through there in chicago what a day-to-day -day is in season for you the time you get up the time you're in the building and maybe what time you leave and is there any downtime at all there's not a lot no i mean so if, if i on monday we'll come in we'll, on a normal sunday we played monday night this week but on a normal monday or sunday game either we fly home after the game or um you know it's a it's a home game, you know, being here in Chicago, the third largest city in the United States, we have, we have a lot of primetime games. Like we'll be, we have, of course, a Thursday night game. We'll have at least two Monday night games. We'll have at least a couple Sunday night games. And then if you're winning, you're fortunate enough later in the season, your games get flushed to Sunday night. So when you're in a big market, like we are, you're going to have some primetime games. That's, that's just the way it is. And, and cause there's a lot of people here in Chicago that love the Chicago bears. So we come in on Monday morning. Um, I'm usually in the office, but anywhere between, 6 15 and 6 30. I just had a daughter on July 31st. So, uh, my first child. And so uh, I try to see her before I like, she usually wakes up around like 5 30. So I try to see her when I get up and, and cause that's the only time I get to see her awake all week. And so, um, and then I'm out of the, I, then when I, I'm getting COVID tested usually by 6 30. And so I'm usually at my chair by 6 45, you know, and then Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night are usually between 1 30 and two in the morning. Wow. You know, there, and because our players, you know, our players don't leave the building until, you know, depending on whether we're in the COVID protocol right now between five and five 30. So you, that's really when your day starts is when the players leave and you're preparing for the next day and you're getting red zone ready or, you know, third down ready or short yard goal line, whatever that may be on uh, card and practice you know, um, obviously making your quarterback teach tapes, all those things and, and tip sheets and, and all that, which takes time. Um, you're constantly working on your quarterback test for the end of the week, you know, which is a, a I don't want to say a novel of one piece, but it's pretty close. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a grind. And Friday we, is our, what we call date night where you're, you're, you try to get home for dinner, you know, and so you're hopefully get home by seven o'clock on Friday night. So it's, it's a, like I tell our quarterbacks all the time, Playing quarterback in the NFL, it's not a job. It's a, it's a lifestyle. It's the same thing for coaches in this league. It, it's, a, it's a true lifestyle. And I'm very fortunate that I kind of knew what I was getting myself into the way I grew up. So you know what it is. All right. It wasn't a shock to my system. Right. right. I'd seen it before. And then number two, my wife is, is awesome. Like she totally supports. She's never one time. We've been together almost 10 years now. She, she's never complained one time in season, off season about how much I work. So um, I'm very fortunate that way. So you have an open date this week, which means yeah. there's no game this weekend. How is this week different from a normal game week? Well, it's my first day off since the last week of July. So that'll be nice. I'll get, get to sleep in a little bit, you know, unless I get my daughter up. But, um, <laughs> you know, she wakes me up. But, uh, yeah, this is our first day off since, you know, the third week of July. So it's going to be weird. It's like you have this what we call the reentry phase right? Where my wife and I are kind of used to being like apart from each other, you know, and kind of FaceTime in here and there and this and that. Well, I come home and, you know, I, I have, you know, I like things my, my certain way at the house, you know, I put my, and my wife drives my wife nuts. <laughs> she's probably by Sunday, she'll be ready for me to head back to work. You know what I'm saying? And sure. I'm tied up here all the time, but that's, what's different is we have actually some time off this week. And so the players are gone right now. They, we met with them this morning. We'd watched the game yesterday uh, and, and we put that to bed. And then I made a little cut up for them this morning. We watched some, some of our good plays and we started to work on Green Bay. We're, we're at Lambeau Field next week, you know, playing the Packers. So we just got a head start on Green Bay and, and uh, then the, those guys left. And, you know, we're doing self-scout right now. Take us back to 2018. Uh, winning a Super Bowl obviously is special. Yeah. Uh, but when you look at the season, now that you're a little far enough away from it, you can look at that whole season with a 3,000 foot view. What comes to mind about that season before you get to the point of, hey, we, we won a Super Bowl? I, I get asked that question a lot. And it's, it's, that's a great question, first off. Um, I, I have never watched the Super Bowl, not once. Um, I didn't watch it on tape. I've seen bits of it. Like I've sure. seen like, I've taken a clip out to show the quarterbacks, hey, this is how we run this play, you know, like, or, you know, if it's something with Nick's footwork, so Nick and I were together in Philadelphia as well with Nick Bowles. Mm -hmm. And I say, Hey, Nick, remember when we took this type of footwork on this drop, I may show a clip here and there. 
I've never watched the game in my because I want it to remember the way I remember it in my mind to stay like that way forever. I'll never watch it. I'll, I won't wa ever ever watch it. But getting back to your question, that's a piece of it. It's not the game at it, it all. That's a, a piece of of the journey, and in the journey to get there is so hard and arduous, and and um, you need so many people pulling in the same direction uh, that that are selfless, that are all about team. Because uh, I don't care who you are, you know, I don't want to speak for any of the teams, but right now there's, I think, one undefeated team in, in our league, and I guarantee they're, they've gone through some tough times that's not documented, you know, that hasn't gotten out to the media. A every team goes through hard times. I mean, we lost right. Carson Wentz was going to be the MVP of the league, and, you know, we lose him out in L.A. playing the Rams on a you know, primetime game, and, you know, I mean, we had to overcome that. We, we lost. People forget that team we lost, I think, you know, six starters, you know, for the year early in the season, you, know, you, you lose guys like, you know, Darren Sproles and Jason Peters and I mean, our starting left tackle, our starting running back. I mean, our starting kicker, the first game of the season. I mean, the, the, the mental toughness and the journey it takes to get, not only get to the game, but then win it on that stage obviously takes a lot of people and a lot of people rolling in the same direction. And so I think that's, what separates the, the good teams from the great teams is every is alignment. It, it's alignment between ownership, management, coaching, the training room, the weight coaches, you know, obviously the, the coaching staff, every, if you're aligned, you, you got a chance. And if you're not, it, it's really hard. So um, that's what reminds me and, and comes back to my brain when, when they talk about that 2018 Eagles team. You know, when JMU won the, the, the national championship in 2016, you're right. There's a lot of things that transpired, a lot of things that people knew nothing about that, that transpired. And when you finally, when you get to the end of it, you look back and go, wow, we really dodged some bullets there. Yep. But in talking to coaches and players, you know, they really didn't have a lot of time to enjoy the victories. Fans, even us in the media, we savor the victories because we've got all week until the next one. When you look back at it like that, was it the same way for you guys where you're just, okay, we got, we went again, we move on, where it was no real time to focus on, hey, let's stop and relish and we just beat this or we just accomplished this because we got a game coming up in seven days. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of bittersweet when, when you win something like that. And it would be probably the, some guys that were on that 2016 team would probably say the same thing. It's a little bit bittersweet because it's the last time you all be all going to be together is in that locker room. The la when you exit that locker room for the last time, that's that's the last time we're all going to be together. And you know whether they have a whether they have a reunion twenty years from now or whatever, there's going to be somebody that's not there. And so that's the bittersweet part of when you accomplish something like that. And obviously, you get to the top of the mountain is that you realize those friendships and those relationships are are never going to be the same. But the cool part. What's really cool is you're, you're, you are, those are almost like your brothers for life. Like I see like guys on the other, on that I'll, that were on that team that I've played against or I see them and you always give, go up and give them a big old hug, you know, and it just brings back those memories and relationships. So yeah, there's time to relish it, but it, it's, it's bittersweet for sure. I think the obvious Super Bowl question, have you ever worn your ring somewhere? I have. Yeah, I wore Here's why, you know, it's, I don't wear it out a lot. I'll bust it out. Like my wife will be like, you haven't worn it in a while. And I'll be like, yeah, you're right. I need to <laughs> wear it once in a while. I, I wore it like I go golfing with my dad every, every summer. We always, we've been to Scott. This will be our, our trip got canceled, unfortunately, this, this past summer for obvious reasons. Um, but the previous three summers we've been to Scotland and we've been to Ireland four times and we're going back to Scotland again. So I wear it over there because like the caddies get a kick out of it, man. They like, you know, like I do it for that their their enjoyment. I, I always tell everyone like the Super Bowl ring to me is no one will ever be able to steal that memory from me. I always tell them like the rings like the Stanley Cup. It's for everyone to enjoy. You know, it's like I let everyone, anyone wear it. That the ring does is just the the symbol of what's in your heart and what's in your brain. From that game no ring can equate to that that's a symbol like so that to me is like icing on the cake yeah, that's well said we, we're gonna wrap things up here in just a couple of minutes let's get to know you a little bit more you've talked about your wife quite a bit yep. tell us how you guys met if you will 
Yeah, we met uh, in San Jose when I was the offensive coordinator at, at San Jose uh, State, and uh, two of my funnest years in coaching. It was an absolute blast working for Mike McIntyre and out there, and um, I, I met her out, and she was a first grade teacher at the time, and and so we immediately clicked right away, and so I, that's why I consider my mom a teacher. So that's <laughs> you know, so we have a lot in common, and so we met, and the rest was history. She and, wanted to go out with me though first, though, so I was, I had to, it was a little persuade. I had to be a little persuasive. So you had to do a little coaching. I'm a good, I'm a good recruiter though. So there you go, there you, you know, go. Really, a little I, coaching. I, I, can, I can sell now. I can, <laughs> I can sell ice to an Eskimo. <laughs> so, but but being being the role you talked about her never complaining, being yeah. the for someone who's never been around the sport and as deep as it is like like you had growing up, when when you guys are okay, we're gonna have a life together. Here's what you need to understand about being a coach's wife. You know, yeah. how how was that conversation? If you don't mind letting us eavesdrop sure. on that a little bit. Sure. Um, well, on our second date, I asked her if she'd be ever willing. She'd never moved out of the state of California before. She'd never wow. lived outside of the state of California. So on our second date, I knew I liked her. So. I asked her, I was like, would you be willing to move out of the state of California? And, you know, I was older at the time. Shoot, I was, when I say older, I mean, in the dating world, older, mm -hmm. you know, mid thirties, right? right? So she was like, yeah, absolutely. I think about it because you don't want to waste anybody's time. So um, I think whenever, you know, you're with somebody like that and if they see you have a passion for something, you're, you're on board with that. And so she sees the passion I have for my job the relationships of forming with the players and the people I work with. And I think when you see the passion in somebody, because you have to be passionate to want to do this. You really do. <laughs> I mean, because let me tell you something, like going through a four-game losing streak in the NFL is is like, it just eats your guts out. So you, you got to be passionate about it and, and you know, be willing to work and, you know, dig out of a hole. And so I think when she sees that, how passionate I am about it, she's been, she's been awesome. How did becoming a father change your life? totally new perspective on things like totally totally new perspective on things like total new perspective on life like in a good way um i mean she's you it, it tells you like it, it you know not to get all sappy here but uh it just shows you like what your your, your parents think you you as a son you know what i mean like and sometimes as a son you can take your parents love for granted at times you know and so it just shows you that you know what unconditional love is. And so uh, it, it's, it's really given me a new look on the way my parents view me and, you know, how, uh, you know, obviously I view my daughter. During the pandemic, a lot of, you couldn't go to work for a while. You were home a bit. I know you were working some, yeah. but were you binge watching anything? Did, do, are you a TV watcher? And, and oh. is there anything that you watch in particular? Oh, I've seen, I've seen them all. <laughs> Whatever that new chess show is out right now, I'm watching that. That's fantastic. So my wife and I binge. We order food in on Friday nights, date night, and we watch that. The new, the new one with Nicole Kidman that's out. I, I don't know the names of any of them. I'm just like, hey, hon, turn on the Nicole Kidman show. <laughs> you no, know, or just turn the chess. Let's watch the chess show. Right. You know, so I don't know the names of any of these things, but they're good. Uh, I've seen them all. I've seen Homeland. Um, I've seen. Uh, I've if you named them, I've, I've probably seen them. Um, I love, I'm a history buff. Uh, my wife makes fun of me because when I'm home, when I do have a few minutes in the off season, like I'm watching like the history channel and I love that stuff. So I, I love, I'm always like, I like to learn, you know, I, I just like to learn new things. It's pretty cool. You talked about being in a major market. And this is the last question, coach. And we appreciate your, your time uh, you, being in a major market and then the ups and downs of being in the NFL, what it's like to go through losing streaks and, and so forth and so on. And everybody's got an opinion Yep. Are you, do you ever listen to sports radio? Are you a no. podcast guy? Do you listen to music at all? How, how, what do you do like when you're traveling? Uh, I watch shows like I've downloaded a bunch of seasons of the West Wing. So I watch that or I sleep, you know, when we're on the plane, because we don't sleep a lot here around here uh, or around the league. You just don't sleep. And so you got to learn how to sleep on the bus, on the plane. Uh, you know, those are the things that you got to learn how to do. But, um, you know, uh, I love to play golf. Um, I do that in the off season, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's just kind of what you do. Well, you're, you're definitely one of the gems uh, of JMU nation. A lot of people are pulling for you and, and, and fond of you and want you to have the utmost success. And there were a lot of people pulling for the Eagles in, in the Super Bowl that weren't fans just because of you. So you made that impact on JMU nation. 
I appreciate you carving out a few minutes to spend with us today and talk to us about your life and your journey, where you are. We hope things turn around there in Chicago. Wish you guys the best of luck the rest of the season. Hey, you guys too. And thanks, Dave and, and Chris, for having me on. And, and I'll tell you, the feeling's mutual. Um, I mean, the people on campus there that have impacted my life. I mean, you know, I, Nick, Nick Langridge and I were classmates together. And we had every every class together at the BS Com building. And, you know, I mean, it's just it's it's just fun watching guys on that end, you know, grow, go grow and, and, you know, do great things as well. And, and I just want to thank everyone for listening and, and having me on.